in this video really uh, what it's really about is you have to take into consideration the implications of automation This is Chicho. Welcome back to the channel and welcome back to our um, little discussion we're having regarding personal finance. Now, what I want to do in this video is sort of continue on uh, with where we left off in the previous video. In the previous video, what we did was talk about one of the most important things we have to keep in mind uh, when we're thinking about investing in anything, maybe investing our time and energy or finances into something, right? Which is basically taking into account our timeline, our time frame, right? And we sort of focused in on Wall Street, uh, talking about uh, the stock market specifically. And the reason I did that was because uh, when it came, comes to stock, when it comes to Wall Street, we can look, in diff look at different time frames, look at different timelines, right? We started off with talking about months and then we sort of went into years and possibly decades. And then we took our timeline here and we narrowed it down to days, minutes, and seconds, and milliseconds when it comes to high frequency trading. And the thing we have to really appreciate uh, regarding that discussion is the only reason we're able to talk about trading, talk about sort of business decision that you can make on the second and millisecond fraction of a second level is because of technology, right? For us, we would not be able to uh, talk about seconds or even minutes, really, trading stocks on a, on a minute basis if it wasn't for computer powers, right? For computer technology. And that's one thing I want to expand on right now specifically related to how computers are bringing about uh, something that's happening that's been happening for a little bit of time right now basically the concept of automation and how automation is going to play out in our current economic system and automation is something that all of us I you know it really doesn't make a difference which field uh, what business you're in if you already have a business or if you're planning on going to school in a certain field to get a certain degree to enter that industry or and start your own business you have to take into account the role of automation and how that's going to play out um, in the near future okay because it's already playing out uh, in certain industries and it's slowly being rolled out in other industries okay and to have a really good appreciation uh, of uh, how this is going to play out what i want to do is just read you a quote uh, just to kick things off and this is a quote uh, that you've heard me read before and it's a quote from stephen hawkins and i sort of put out a video of a reading of a uh, of some quotes and it was more politically oriented but there was three quotes in there from three different people which we can think about of being uh, very relevant in our current economic system as well and politics economics again is the same beast right but when it comes to technology uh, these three quotes one one was uh, Stephen Hawkins which we're going to read the other one was Carl Sagan and the third one was um, Jacob Applebaum those three things are related to what we're going to talk about right now which is basically computer technology and in a more focused way uh, automation right so quoting Stephen Hawkins from black holes and baby universes page 28 uh, and it was a speech given in Spain in 1989 um, quote if we accept that we cannot prevent science and technology from changing our world we can at least try to ensure that the changes they make are in the right directions in a democratic society this means that the public needs to have a basic understanding of science so they can make informed decisions and not leave them in the hands of experts and that quote has a political 
overtone to it, right? As does the as does the speech it was given. But the first part of that quote, if we accept that we cannot prevent science and technology from changing our world, right? Well, we can't. We can only direct those changes, right? And that's something we have to really appreciate. And we can sort of work within those changes that are happening and use those changes to our advantage, right? So that's the thing we have to keep in mind. No matter what you're doing, no matter where you think society is going in the future, and what you're investing your time, your energy, your money on, you have to take into account the concept of automation. Really, this is huge. And the reason I'm emphasizing this is a lot of people are not thinking about this. And one of the things uh, we should keep in mind when it comes to, uh, when it comes to uh, technology and how technology rolls out uh, in our societies, and technology is not just computer powers, right? Technology um, has been being rolled out in our societies uh, throughout decades, throughout centuries, throughout millennia, right? What we're talking about right now specifically is computer power, processing power, right? Because, uh, you know, the, the invention of the wheel was technology that changed the economic system at the time. The invention of fire was new technology that changed that economic system. Gutenberg's printing press was technology that was introduced in an economic system that changed that economic system. Those things took years for them to play out, right? What's happening with processing power with computers, the time frame, right, that new technology uh, how fast that's changing our society is becoming shorter and shorter, right? And that's specifically something related to computers. We haven't seen these types of changes come into play this fast previously in history, okay? And if you want to get a feel for, um, just for, for your own reference, if you want to get a feel for how technology changes certain industries, there are certain industries that, and end up rolling out new technology faster than other industries. When it came to um, computers, there were three, three or four industries that really rolled out uh, computer power uh, faster than other industries. There was um, the adult entertainment industry, maybe a gambling or other things. Um, they were one of the first industries that really took advantage of personal computers and the internet and streaming videos and stuff like this right and secure communication right another industry that exists everywhere around the world is the illicit uh, industry i guess illicit system of doing business which is anything that is, that's really well use your imagination any type of illicit uh, business really started rolling out uh, computer technology quite rapidly, right? And those are two things that I don't think we're going to talk too much about when it comes to personal finance. But one of the other industries that has rolled out technology in a way that uh, in certain parts was decades ahead of other industries, and we're sort of seeing some of that stuff being rolled out now, is the finance sector of our economic system, which is one of the reasons why we start talking about uh, the stock market thing, you know, talking about shorter time frame of uh, doing trades, because the only reason that we can do trades on this level is because of computers, because of technology, right? And what we're gonna do is sort of expand on the topic of Wall Street, the stock market trading uh, a little bit further um, where I'm going to read you a couple of short segments from an article which sort of gives us a history of how uh, computers came into play um, in finance 
um, when it comes to trading stocks. And it's, uh, it's a fantastic little history. And keep this in mind uh, when we're reading that, is that finance, uh, Wall Street was, was one of the first places that we saw computing power change that industry. And what we're seeing right now play out in our current economic system when it comes to Wall Street, Main Street, and Wall Street, and everything that's happened in the last 10, 15 years, right, with uh, the economic crisis and the financialization and the, how how our current economic system is laid out. I don't want to go too deep into that. We will later and uh, talk about some of the pitfalls of that and some of the excerpts from this article and this article is must read okay and i'll tell you what it is right now uh, before we go on any further it's an article by uh, martin armstrong and it's called behind behind the full behind the curtain the full monty okay and if you've read this you'll know why this is important if you haven't read this um, it's pretty important to read when it you know, if you have a want to have a good appreciation for how Wall Street works and how stocks, stock trading works and how our current system works when it comes to financializing or commodifying uh, everything. OK, but before we get into this, uh, what I want to do is sort of talk about how we can think about uh, how computers uh, play out in our current economic system. And one of the things we have to appreciate is uh, computers are disruptive innovation. What we talked about initially uh, in the first set of videos when we talked about uh, disruptive innovation, differential accumulation, and we did a maximizing, uh, maximizing revenue problem, right? Disruptive innovation is basically technology that's come into play where it's forcing other, forcing industries to change their business models to uh, use this technology to improve their business practices, to improve profitability, I guess, or it's technology that is coming into play, which is gonna make certain industries completely obsolete, right? And we've had this happen throughout history, throughout decades, centuries, millennia, mill millennia right? When it comes to invention of fire or discovery of fire, invention of the, uh, of the wheel, to the printing press, to electricity, to, to computers, right? And one thing we have to have uh, another appreciation for, some of those technologies took a long time for them to roll out in our economic system. Computers is not taking a long time to roll out in our economic system. Personal computers did. Uh, the internet, to a certain degree, based on what's happening right now, how fast things are uh, moving along right now, even the internet took a long time to filter within our society, right? Because if you think about it, personal computers really came into play in the late 1970s, early 1980s, right? Mid 1980s. The internet came into play in the late 1980s, early 1990s, right? Um, our ability to process big data came into play in the late 1980s, mid 1980s, late 19, uh, sorry, uh, mid 1990s, late 1990s, early 2000s. And our ability to do secure, high speed um, communication online, maybe streaming or banking, really didn't come into effect until the early 2000s to the mid 2000s. And what we're seeing right now come into play in the last 10 years or so is automation. And it's going to change things on uh, the same level, if not greater, as did personal computers, as did the internet, as did our ability to do processing of big data, as did our ability to do secure high-speed communication online. The big difference is automation is assumed and what's happening right now is that it's gonna take away more job than it's gonna create. Because with previous technology, what's happened is um, most 
other disruptive innovation that has come into our economic systems, they've created more jobs than they've taken away, right? The invention of the wheel created more jobs than it took away. Uh, initially, certain people lost their jobs. They were carrying things. Now you could roll things, right? The invention of electricity initially took away a certain number of jobs, but it created a huge number of jobs. The reason we had so, so much growth within our uh, uh, with our societies is because of electricity, right? And computers, you can think about it the same way. Personal computers initially took away a certain number of jobs, very few, but they introduced a tremendous number of jobs, right? The internet took away a certain number of jobs, but introduced a huge number of jobs, right? The ability to process big data created a lot of jobs. The ability to communicate at high speed created a a lot of jobs it took away a certain number of jobs right when it comes to mainstream media right when it came, comes to entertainment when it comes to reporting news right there's a lot of industries that have collapsed because of high-speed secure communication right because of our ability to stream video and share information right so there's a lot of industries that have been hurt because of this but there's a lot of growth that's also happened when it comes to automation, uh, the way it seems to be playing out, it's taking away more jobs than it's creating, and that's going to be a huge problem for us, um, for the short term anyway, right? Because any business that we're thinking about investing in, any business that we're thinking about starting, any field that we plan on studying to be able to get a career, to be able to get jobs and generate income and manage your personal finances is going to be affected with automation okay and the way you can think about automation is is the following um is, and the best way to think about it is uh think about it in a way of how we end up making decisions right the way we end up making decisions is we look at a situation we decide you know all the content uh what the important variables are from that situation and based on our experiences our education uh, and our society you know what we've been exposed to we make a certain decision based on what we're experiencing what we're seeing and we decide to do something right that's what that's that's the way a human being basically ends up making decisions right so basically what we do is we have a certain amount of input right so whenever we look at a situation, and this is a pretty important, it's something that I uh, sort of had a, got a full appreciation for as I got older, is what I see happening may be different than what you see happening. When I look at a situation, what I deem to be important may be different than what you deem to be important, right? What your mind, your experiences, your knowledge considers to be uh, the most important variables in a certain situation, right? When I look at something, I'm looking at my room, I might look at the plants first and consider those to be the most important thing in this room, right? I might be looking at my bookshelf and thinking that the books are the most important things. You might be looking at the situation and you might look at the albums and say, hey, there's albums here. The albums are the most important thing, right? So data... Uh, when we acquire data uh, right away when we're acquiring it there's a certain filter being put on uh, where we're considering certain things to be important okay or certain things to be worth noting right and that's the same way computers to a certain degree work when we're entering data into computers into programs really code we decide what the variables are what's important what's the data being put in right and what we do with that data so when i look at a situation i end up processing that information based on again my experiences my education and that part is called the processing part right computers do the same thing they take all of this information, right? And 
they process it. And based on that processing, based on the code that was written, they make decisions, as do we, right? We look at a situation, we decide what the important information is in that situation, based on our experiences and our education, our knowledge, we make a decision, right? We take into account all the variables, whatever we could make a note of. We decide what we're giving weight to, right? One of these things that we give weight to, but we think is important, maybe a combination of three things here, right? And then based on our processing, we make a decision, and that's our output. And let's call that um, what to do, right? What to do. To do. Okay. This is basically the same way computers work, right? We feed them data based on the code. They make it, you know, they process the information and they give us an output. This is playing out in automation in a huge way, in a huge way, right? Maybe from self-driving cars to just simple robots in factories or automated tellers in grocery stores, right? Or fast food chains or restaurant, restaurants and whatnot, right? So this system, this process is having tremendous impact or on our current economic system, right? Because one of the things that's happened is we've been able to input more and more data into programs. And because our processing speed has reached a level where we can process all that data, we're able to create basically neural networks, AI, to make decisions for us or to automate things, right? And this is something, for one to understand, um, wasn't in play a few years ago. Okay, a few years ago we had a bigger role to play here than we did here. Okay, and if you recall, um, uh, if you've been following my blog, uh, in two thousand and six I wrote a little article, um, sort of talking about data and processing and how that's playing out on a political front and how that could play out on a political front. I call that article Anomalies, Prisons, and Geophysics, uh, how governments use data and how to stop them uh, on a political front anyway, uh, if you don't agree with what's happening. But um, we did a reading of that as well. I sort of did a soft-spoken reading of that because I think uh, that's extremely important. And I've been following sort of this progression of processing large data for a while now. And in that piece, we sort of mentioned that good data is extremely important. So if the data being entered into the software, into the code is not accurate, or it's not taking into account some of the most important variables, right? Then that's a place where we, we have a weak leak, in, weak leak in the chain, right? things can seriously go wrong, right? We might have forgotten to account for a certain variable, right? And the processing is basically uh, the interpreter, um, the code written to be able to take this data and process it to give us an output. So keep in mind that there's two places where this system is dependent on, right? Basically almost 100%. One is the accuracy of the data and this, the magnitude of data, how large the data is, because right now in our current economic system, something that has tremendous value that didn't really have this much value in the past is big data. So data now has because, become something that is worth a lot, right? So the amount of data that we have is extremely important, the accuracy of the data and the code which is basically your expertise, whoever, you know, whoever's working here to write the code to be able to do the processing, may it be more hands-on, us writing the code and having a, you know, picking the important variables from the data set or letting a neural network uh, 
make that decision for us. You know, one of the places uh, where I can think this is happening when it comes to um, a supervised learning is um, I had a conversation with a with one of my students who's very active online um, and my student brought this up and we we're talking about YouTube videos and how censorship is coming into play um, on some platforms right and the platform that you're watching it right now is definitely coming into play right and what's happened is Google YouTube has hired thousands of people and they're basically getting their employees to look at videos even segments and flagging them and they're also put out apps where they're getting you the viewer to flag uh, you know and that's that option has been available to flag certain uh, videos certain content right and uh, when I was talking to my student you know this subject came up censorship and stuff like this and um, different platforms video sharing the discussion of video different video sharing platforms came about and how you know there's certain monopolies at play right now and my student mentioned that what uh, Google YouTube Alphabet Inc is doing is basically running a program in the background which is monitoring uh, 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 monitoring uh, all the activity the human beings sitting there uh, flagging video or sending comments or doing whatever it is uh, their contribution whatever it is they think requires censoring or is inappropriate content the program is monitoring the, that information the time code when they did it how long they watched it uh, which part of the video that appeared the length of the video who's putting it out where it's being put out from the amount of data I can't even imagine uh, you know what they're collecting and how the process is going but what they're doing is they have computers right now learning from that behavior and in the near future they're not going to require any more employees to do that censoring to do that monitoring because they're going to get the program the code right the algorithms to do that work for them right so all of those jobs at Google uh, at other tech companies where they're sitting there going through the through the content to see what's appropriate and what's not appropriate based on their business model because they have the right to do this right it's their business model it's their pra platform they can decide uh, themselves who they want their audience to be right so they're going to fine tune that and get some kind of output and they're going to decide which industry they want to function in right is it maybe just the adult industry or they want to be family oriented or they want to be more geared towards younger audience right it's their business decision so they're running software and that software is learning from the behavior of their employees and the behavior of um, their customers right you me viewing YouTube videos and giving us our, giving us giving them our feedback right so all of those jobs are going to disappear so if anybody's working in that field where they're watching videos and you know flagging videos that that's most likely the short-term thing unless they're willing to work their way up the ladder because what's going to happen majority of that work is going to be automated right and the only human part of that interaction that decision making is going to come into play in the management level right and that's one place where you know on a short term automation is coming to play uh, automation for sure is coming to play in uh, self-driving cars it is going to come into play in self-driving cars right and incorporate that sort of think about that in the same breath as you know different types of apps that have already come into play that has completely changed our uh, certain industries when it comes to ride sharing apps uh, apps like uber or taxi service apps and stuff like this right I've uh, I sort of uh, 
have been following that aspect of uh, our economic system where uh, for a while um, I started talking with uh, taxi cab drivers um, you know about 10 years ago or so basically I was asking them how uh, their computer systems were coming into play and I sort of uh, got involved in this in the early 2000s where uh, taxi cabs were introducing a new technology uh, where they were it wasn't dispatch calling in uh, who wanted rides where it was just popping up on you know the little network I forget what the systems were this was in 2000s there was a couple of companies in Vancouver that were um, introducing this software and the hardware as well into um, for taxi cabs so I, I knew some people involved in that industry so I followed that a little bit and they were rolling this out fairly rapidly so I've been tracking the system a while so you know I've been talking with gas taxi cab drivers for a good 10 15 years or so and one thing that I noticed um, was when uber ride sharing technology apps were coming into play there was some taxi cab drivers um, people working in that industry that really didn't appreciate the full impact of what was happening and previously the way it worked was if you wanted to drive a taxi in my area anyway you need to be you need to be licensed okay and those licenses the government in general would um, sell as raffles and they would sell them for a few thousand dollars five to ten thousand dollars and because they were limited um, sort of an arbitrary scarcity was put into the system based on licensing introduced by government right in the aftermarket those licenses were selling for a lot of money right they were selling an upwards of you know I talked with uh, uh, some of the information that I got initially you know they were going for double triple they were going for 80,000 100,000 150,000 200,000 250,000 dollars right so if you were able to get your hands on a license to drive a taxi right you could have sold that license for you know hundred fifty thousand dollars two hundred thousand dollars two hundred fifty thousand dollars right but what happened with apps uh, ride-sharing apps when they came into play the cost of those licenses plummeted to a level where last time I talked to someone it was um, last year about a year ago or so uh, so this is a year outdated and they said that the, those people who had the licenses who had bought those licenses to drive a taxi cab and had paid you know hundred thousand dollars hundred fifty thousand dollars two hundred thousand dollars right couldn't even sell those licenses for twenty thousand dollars now right or fifteen thousand dollars I think the lowest I heard was one person was having a hard time selling it at anywhere between five to ten thousand dollars right so if you didn't take into consideration how not automation just apps technology computer power was going to play out here in your industry and 10 years ago you bought a taxi cab license for two hundred thousand dollars and you couldn't even sell it now for let's say twenty thousand dollars you just lost ninety percent of your investment right so you really have to take that in consideration so you know what did that app do that app basically I don't know if it's taken away more jobs than created more jobs my guess is created more jobs because there's a lot of people uh, doing you know ride sharing using ride sharing apps uh, to pick up customers maybe through uber um, I'm not sure what the technical term is for specifically uber type of software or ride sharing uh, apps software right I'm pretty sure there's more people that are driving uber cars right now or using those kinds of apps to generate secondary income than there are than there were tax cab drivers right but one place you know the next step for this could be possibly uh, you know if you merge that technology with automation when it comes to self-driving cars which will come into effect you know we're basically one step away from you know a company coming into play where they can buy a whole bunch of self-driving cars and go back to getting a license 
from a municipality, right? To be able to function as a company where these self-driving cars using apps now become your taxis, right? So what you could do is use an app call a taxi and a self-driving car would come and pick you up and take you to where you were going, right? Completely automating that whole process, eliminating the need for taxi cab drivers and eliminating the jobs. I don't want to say the need, but how lucrative it is to be a taxi cab driver or how lucrative it is to be a ride-sharing driver with companies like Uber and whatnot, right? So all of a sudden, automation will make all those jobs disappear, but will it create a lot more jobs? That's something that's still in debate, right? Again, it's something you're gonna have to consider. It's something in your industry uh, that might come into play, right? 3D printing is another one. You know, a lot of industries might be immune to automation, but a lot of industries will not be immune uh, uh, to automation. In some places, that stuff is going to roll out a lot faster than others, right? Uh, there's automation being rolled out in construction right now, right? There's 3D printers, large-scale 3D printers that are printing structures, right? How viable is that? At some point, it's going to be viable. Uh, on a smaller scale anyway. We'll see that rolling out. Um, is it a good idea to go into, uh, to stay in the bank teller business or on a retail level where you're a teller or where you're working in a restaurant where you're taking orders? Because what's happening right now is there's a lot of automation coming into play when it comes to, um, grocery stores when it comes to certain types of fast food restaurants right they're introducing automatic tellers and some places are sort of forcing their customers to use automatic tellers right if you go i go to certain places where there's a few automatic tellers and when it comes to human beings working the, the register you know they only have a couple of people working there and the lineups are really big to check out your stuff right so some people are being forced out of frustration to use automated machines to do their shopping, right? Is that a good thing or a bad thing? That's something you'll have to uh, consider, right? That's something uh, that, you know, we'll see how it plays out. Uh, it might free people up um, to do more things, to do, uh, to get into different fields, right? There's. You know, another example I have is um, in the past, in the last few decades, what we've seen was basically industry uh, factories moving their um, production chain, right, where they're making materials to countries where there was cheap labor, right, where it be to Asia, to South America, to Central America, to Africa, uh, to different parts of the world other than the western world where labor was cheap right so there's a lot of factories being built uh in a huge part of the world right where they were hiring hiring a lot of people uh for fairly cheap and those jobs were basically jobs that people were losing in the western world right now was that positive or negative there was a lot of job a lot of wealth created in certain countries and there was a certain number of jobs being lost in certain countries now the number of jobs being lost i think was less than the number of jobs that were being created right there was a lot of inequality being created in the same process right and people losing their jobs in the western world that were extremely well-paying jobs all of a sudden we're having a hard time finding new jobs to go to right because they've been working in a certain field for 5, 10, 15 years, 20 years, and they have to be re-educated, right? But what's happening right now with automation is a lot of factories, not a lot, but we're seeing the beginning stages of it. Some of those industries are now bringing those factories back to the Western world, right? So there's going to be a lot of jobs being lost in 
a lot of the countries that were hiring people on the cheap, right? Where labor wages were really low, where environmental regulations didn't really exist. There were no labor laws. There were no unions, right? So it was really cheap to make materials there. But what's happening right now? Some of those businesses, some of those industries are now moving those factories back to the Western world. One of them that recently, last year, announced that there were a uh, German company that were going back to Germany was Adidas, right? Uh, last year, 2016, they mentioned that they're bringing a factory back to Germany from, I believe it was China or Asia anyway, and they were going to start producing textiles, shoes in Germany closer to the point of purchase, right? And that's something to consider as well because that's going to have a huge effect for businesses, right? You don't have to pay for those transportation costs and your carbon footprint becomes less. But there was a catch in that, uh, in that announcement. Uh, the factory coming back is almost going to be fully automated. So there isn't going to be any factory jobs being created there. There's going to be a lot of jobs being lost in the Asian area, wherever they were set up, right? There's going to be a lot of jobs lost there. But there isn't going to be an equivalent number of jobs created in Germany on the factory level anyway, right? On the factory floor. And... there's definitely not going to be more jobs created, right? And that's the role of automation. And that's the role it's going to have in our society. So in this video, really, uh, what it's really about is you have to take into consideration the implications of automation. It's huge. It's going to play out in so many different fields, in so many different fields. And there are certain fields that are gonna get a boom. They're gonna get a huge boost and are, they're already seeing a huge boost, huge demand, right? I don't know if it's, if they're gonna create as many jobs as are being lost because of automation. I don't know if they're gonna give birth to new industries. Well, they are, right? New new businesses and those businesses are going to create more jobs that are being lost one place that's seeing a huge growth is education right what we're doing right now because a lot of people that are losing their, their jobs they're going to be have to be retrained they're going to have to acquire new tools to be able to find something else that they're either passionate about to go into or they can find jobs in right because they have to manage their personal finances right education is 100 percent. another industry that's seeing a huge boost a huge growth is uh, the healthcare industry in large part well there's two reasons for that one of them is uh, aging population in the west another one is our life uh, lifestyles right there's a huge number of jobs being created in my area anyway when it comes to massage therapists when it comes to uh, kinesiologists when it comes to chiropractors when it comes to Pilates instructors, physical fitness instructors right so there's a lot of jobs being created there so there's a whole bunch of secondary tertiary areas. there's a ripple effect throughout our economic system right sort of a long-winded discussion of what uh, how technology is playing out uh, the role of automation is playing out but this is such a broad broad uh, broad topic and it covers so many different um, so many different industries so many different places this is playing out and uh, one thing I want to do now is uh, sort of read to you uh, this little segment from this article by Martin Armstrong, Martin A. Armstrong, and he wrote this in 2010. And it's gonna give us a pretty good idea, sort of feel of how technology as disruptive innovation played out 
when it can when it, you know when it comes to finance when it comes to the stock market when it came comes to wall street okay and this is going to continue change have a huge effect in our economic system uh, because this introduction of personal computing uh, into our economic system into wall street into the stock market really changed the game and it had uh, you know a domino effect a ripple effect throughout uh, our societies uh, of the way how you know you know directly related to uh, the 2018 2008 financial crisis directly related to how wall street the banking industry how to finance industry is working right now how wall street is functioning right now and how our political system is functioning right now it's a little uh history on how computers uh changed the game when it came to wall street came to the stock market and i found it incredibly intriguing uh very fascinating and again i highly recommend it uh, it's by martin a armstrong behind the curtain the full Monty it's available online I found it online anyways PDF uh, and other formats you can download it print it or just read it directly online I printed it because I read this a while ago and I made some notes uh, and it's well worth reading if you want to know how our economic system works how finance works but let me read you this part and this is from page 15 of the PDF that I downloaded and uh, the area that's in it's uh, called the age of computers okay just on top there the age of computers okay and I'm gonna read you a little segment a little paragraph I'm gonna read a couple other segments here and then we're gonna move on uh, to a couple of other areas okay so quote in 1985 the Supreme Court ruled in a major case low versus SEC the Securities Exchange Commission uh, number 472 USA 181 1985 that held the publishing of analysis was protected by the First Amendment and did not require to be regulated by the sect okay. and what that means basically the First Amendment in the United States is that freedom of expression freedom to express yourself to have your opinion right and there's a little bit more to that but this is what it's really related to so basically the ruling in 1985 said that the government couldn't prevent people from looking at companies doing their own analysis and writing articles and giving a buy or sell recommendation and talking about that business that was protected on the first amendment right so once a law a rule and a political realm was clarified all of a sudden the doorways doorway was opened where it gave birth to a whole new industry and thanks to personal computing processing speed right that in turn changed our economic system right so the two played together right you know it was a question of chicken or the egg which gave birth to the uh to the first my belief is personal computers gave birth to the law being clarified because what was happening was uh and you can read this there's a build up to this okay so i'm taking ex excerpts from this but what was happening is some people were using computer computer programs to write business analysis and selling that analysis to certain investors and those investors were making business decisions that forced this clarification in the law right so in 1995 the supreme court said publishing <coughs> uh, analysis was protected on the first amendment and we skip a few a paragraph and a few lines and uh, just the first sentence of one of the paragraph says this everyone was rushing out and buying IBM desktop computers and try to create models so in Wall Street those people that were involved in finance were 
going out and buying computers and using this processing power to create models on certain companies, right? We skip a paragraph, uh, a couple of paragraphs. Next paragraph, the greatest problem that Wall Street ran into with their attempt to model the markets, you have a huge gap between the trader and the programmer. They do not even speak the same language. What the trader is trying to explain, the program is then trying to write in computer language. It is not easy. The trader does not comprehend how a computer operates, so he skips such basic steps that the programmer, not understanding trading, cannot fill in the gap. So basically what he's saying, um, Martin Armstrong is saying, is that there was a gap between the data and the processing, right? The computer programmers were writing code to process the information that the traders were giving them, but the traders didn't understand how the programs were working and the programmers didn't really appreciate all the nuances in trading, right? They weren't taking into account all the variables here, right? And it goes into some detail about um, the 1987 uh, collapse in the stock market and how that played out and, you know, um, how certain people were blaming computers, the introduction of personal computers and all these different types of analysis coming up. Uh, for causing the 1987 stock market collapse, right? And uh, it continues on the next segment. And just one little sentence and one paragraph. Over the next to, eight, next eight to nine years, computer models were getting more sophisticated, but at the same time, more myopic and dangerous. We skip a sentence or two. The collapse of long-term capital management, quote again, the collapse of long-term, uh, the collapse of long-term capital management illustrated the danger between merging the fields of experience with non, no practical risk management. What was happening was twofold. It was a blending of manipulation insider info and sophisticated computer models that did not take into consideration what happens when the market goes into total illiquidity, right? And liquidity in the markets is huge. Liquidity basically means uh, how fast can you sell something? How fast can you change from one asset value to another? May it be from stocks to cash and from cash to something else, right? So basically what Armstrong is saying is the computer models here didn't take into account what happens when there are dramatic changes happening in the markets in the stock market where all of a sudden the market is not liquid right the programmers didn't take that into consideration you can think about that as an anomaly an asymptote right when it came to talking about uh certain types of functions we talked a little bit about this in uh, the language of mathematics right what happens when we had an asymptote and basically in the 1987 uh, crash the stock market had an asymptote and it collapsed, right? There were safety nets set up and it recovered, right? But not after a lot of people a lot of, lost a lot of money, both noobs, people that were new in the industry and experts, right? And people blamed computers, blamed uh, analysts for causing that crash. And, you know, he goes on saying, that you know, computer models were telling people to sell, and it was the analysts that didn't take into consideration a lot of variables, what was happening in the markets, that didn't sell, right? So all of a sudden, the difference between prices was huge, right? And it continues on into, you know, we skip a few pages, and it goes into a section called the birth of derivatives, right? The birth of derivatives. Now what we're gonna do is read just a little segment here and I'm gonna read you a little segment here. Actually, we're gonna read this whole paragraph and I'm gonna read you the segment, okay? And here's the thing, computer 
computers when they came into personal computers when they came into play in the stock market they created a certain number of jobs they create a whole new industry right financial advisors personal financial advisors right in a big way in a big way they, they existed before but that really gave birth to something else and they also gave birth to derivatives and derivatives are basically secondary markets where you can trade one of the first order derivatives that we have are call and put options and call and put options in the stock market are basically you buy the rights to sell something at a certain price for a certain period of time or you buy the rights to buy something at a certain price for a certain period of time the first one's called puts the first and the second one is called calls and it's basically you know betting on another bet right it's risky and there are multiple derivatives in play so what's happened is computer technology processing abilities right moore's law their ability to process faster and faster doubling of doubling of processing ability every 18 months since the 1960s up to this point right up to 20 years ago basically gave birth to derivatives and that created a whole bunch of jobs again right and you know was basically considered to be disruptive innovation in an in industry that had to adjust in Wall Street that had to adjust to this new system okay um, and one thing um, one thing I should mention is pretty important to note that um, I don't think no actually he talks about it here but some of these computer models on Wall Street that people were trading on a on a millisecond level they're not really thinking about long term they're not running models that are looking at a company thinking about what this company is going to be doing five years from now ten years from now they were looking at the millisecond scale right so they were looking at being able to make profits on very short term with high frequency right we sort of mentioned that in the previous video talked about how you could make a lot of money right your investment would be worth a lot if you were able to decrease your time frame right so what they were really doing was not making money in the rise in value of that stock but they were making money in the arbitrage and the difference between the selling and the buying price right that's what computer technology that's what computer power allowed people to do within finance within this for the stock market right so let's continue on with this little reading from this uh, important uh, must read if you're involved in the in the stock market right behind the curtain the full monty by martin armstrong okay. coding again the birth of derivatives in so far as the financial markets was concerned came after the turning of our economic confident confidence model uh, model in 1985 that's when the sec ruling happened right continue quoting from there onward there was a mad rush to bring in computers and create models princeton economics was very well known behind the public scene we were primary institutional advisory for the big corporates and banks around the world i would rarely grant interviews with the american press for clients had long made it clear that they were paying the big bucks for us uh, paying the big bucks to us and they did not want to see the same forecast given out for free on the front pages of wall street journal so everyone knew we had sophisticated computer models long before anyone else and i have been told this perhaps then fueled the rush to get into the field i am not sure that is 100 percent correct but there was a mad dash to suddenly get sophisticated by the 1987 crash the press was blaming somehow computer trading portraying that the computers were trading on their own right so in 1987 because of the 1987 crash people blame computers for putting in trades selling uh, independent independently right causing a flash crash right and we've seen that happen um, in the stock market before we saw that happen 
in uh, 2008. We saw that happen uh, recently-ish. I can't remember when. We, we've seen that happen in Bitcoin. There was a flash crash uh, in Bitcoin, cryptocurrencies really across the board in um, about a year, year and a half ago when the price went from $250 down to $150 for a few seconds, a few minutes, and then came back up again, right? So people were blaming code programs for the flash crash. Quoting again, the last little section that we're going to quote, quote, the truth of the matter is that all the firms were trying to use computers not, not to in any, any way forecast the future, but to create a way to exploit the differences and arbitrage the markets as a whole, right? So again, computer programs were not trying to forecast that a certain company stock was going to collapse or some kind of news was coming out that their, the value of their stock was going to depreciate. What the computer programs were doing was they had written code where they were buying and selling at a high frequency and trying to make money on the differences, right? We're sort of connected to differential accumulation, right? Differential accumulation says if you can collect at a higher percentage, if you can accumulate assets, accumulate, get a rate of return at a higher rate than the norm, than the averages, then you're in the money. And that's what computer programs are trying to do. And one of the ways you can do that is look for higher yield, look for higher returns, right, over a certain period of time, or you can decrease your time frame, right, and make a smaller return, but that return becomes compounded, and over a long period of time, your gains, right, uh, your rate of return, accumulation of power is huge, okay, and that's what computer programs we're doing, and that's to a certain degree what computer programs uh, in large part are doing right now in the markets, and not just in these markets, not just in Wall Street in trading stocks, but in other markets as well, okay? And that's, you know, I'm not sure how neural networks, artificial intelligence, for lack of a better word, are gonna come into play in this. Um, if you like, if you like your animation, there's um, uh, just taking a little uh, tangent. But if you like your animation, there's an episode uh, from Cowboy Bebop where they actually uh, is it Cowboy Bebop? I believe it's Cowboy Bebop, or it could be Ghost in the Shell, but I think it's Cowboy Bebop where uh, the bounty hunter is basically Cowboy Bebop is a story of uh, futuristic story of bounty hunters. And uh, in this one episode, they're looking for this one person and they end up, I'm giving spoilers here, but they end up finding the person that they're looking for. Uh, and it ends up that the person is dead, but they're one of the richest people in the galaxy, uh, in the world, because what they've done is set up some kind of program that has been buying and selling uh, commodities, I believe it was gold or anything, buying and selling on the markets. Uh, based on the code and the code was running after they were dead right so they the program was continuously accumulating assets right it was a, it was a nice episode it was a cool episode and sort of touches on automation AI and neural networks and um, supervised learning and deep learning and and whatever you want to call this right of how uh, automation technology computer power is changing our world, changing our current economic system. And that's something we have to keep in mind when it comes to automation and what we're going to plan for the future. Okay. Um, that's sort of uh, the basis of what I wanted to cover in this video. I know we touched on a lot of stuff and I really, again, it really goes back to Stephen Hawking's quote, right? If we accept that we cannot prevent science and technology from changing our world, we can at least try to ensure that the changes they make are in the right direction, directions, right? For us personally, for our community, for our family, for our society, for our investments, right? However, you know, whatever level you want to think about, uh, wherever you want to take this, right? Um, 
that's basically the gist of it. And what I want to do from here in the next video is sort of expand on this topic of trading, of what we give sort of value to, where we want to function, and, uh, you know, overlap that with uh, technology, right? And what we're going to do in the next video is talk about currencies and trade, trade basically, and what we personally uh, are deciding to give value to. And that's huge. That's playing out in a huge way within our society. And it goes hand in hand with computer technology and stuff. Okay. Uh, that's about it for now. I'll see you guys in the next video.